everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT supervisor and therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. We have a very exciting guest today. We have Kenny Standerfer. He is the, as Sue likes to call him, the EFT cowboy. He is the EFT trainer in Tennessee. He's founder of the Tennessee Center for EFT. He also has a clinical practice on Music Row in Nashville, and he's an adjunct professor sometimes at the university out there in Tennessee, and he just does phenomenal work. And we're very excited to have him to our show. And today we're going to be talking about attachment needs and emotions and how to explain these to withdrawers or the type of clients that have led very independent lives and they're very happy even though they are in marriages and don't understand why their spouse wants more contact and why this is a big deal. So thank you, Kenny, for being on our show. Glad to be here. So if you could start us off, maybe could we talk about the nature of attachment needs and what those are a little bit more specifically? Yeah, I mean, you know, they're the basic the basic attachment needs are comfort, reassurance, uh, connection, closeness, care. Those are the ones that really are the foundation, at the foundation of who we all are. There's also the, uh, the emotions, too, those core emotions that are really related in many ways connected to those um, attachment needs and longings that we have and that there's you know the ones that we usually typically refer to as sad angry fear shame joy and surprise um and so um yeah they it really is at the center or the core of who we are and um and we we come into this world with those it's interesting to me to think about even babies now we know that they already, and many times um, in the last trimester, they've already can recognize mom's voice. They can recognize dad's voice. They even can recognize mom's preference for food. Um, and uh, so it really happens uh, very, very early. Um, and then, of course, the first thing that happens when a child is born is it's brought up real close to mom's face, uh, right? She's, it's held and coddled. So from the very beginning, there's the comfort and the reassurance and all those things that we all need. And of course that starts out in a, in a very big way. I mean, they're very dependent on us for that. Uh, very hard for a child to self-regulate, right? So it's impossible for a baby to self-regulate. And that's a process that kind of develops over time. Um, you know, and then it takes us to, adulthood I always uh, we know I think through some of Jeff Simpson's work long-term studies and stuff we know that uh, attachment style or coping strategy which I prefer using um, that we develop happens very early in life and has a lot to do with our early caretakers for sure um, it's sort of the blueprint for how we do relationships but to me the the unbelievable part of that or the neat part of that is, is that even though it's a blueprint, the ink never dries. Um, we can have other, other relationships can shape us and move us, uh, you know, to more, maybe toward more secure places uh, or sometimes maybe more insecure places. But it's just interesting to me that how, how it doesn't take, but just um, a few people really reaching out and meeting those core attachment needs for comfort connection and reassurance to really change who we are and uh that's a pretty significant thing i think so i think that was very beautifully said i love how you said that attachment is you know our blueprint our early attachment but the ink never dries that's that's mm -hmm. so perfect that's so beautiful and I also love how you mentioned that babies in the womb can also detect the sound of mom's voice, which I'm sort of connecting to. I know um, some of the neuroscientific research that's come out talked about how porosity in our voice is the only unambiguous cue of safety. 
Mm-hmm. So I wonder if because that's maybe the first thing that's that's developed in human beings is that audible detection in people's voice for safety, wow. even the womb we're, we're picking that up. So it makes sense why that would be still so salient, even in adults. And wow. too, what's important is if our early attachment relationships are our blueprint. So, you know, let's talk about the type of clients who, you know, their parents worked a lot when they were little kids and they were left on their own, not necessarily in a neglectful way, but in a like, and maybe it could be considered neglect, but a more, you know, entertain yourselves, go out and play with your friends and the neighborhood kids. Mm -hmm. And they learn just to entertain themselves and, and, you know, they didn't spend a lot of time at home. And then they also maybe got jobs. I have a lot of clients, particularly I find this common in male clients, but it may not be gender specific, but you know, they might've started getting jobs at like 12, 13, you know, washing neighbors cars or, you know, loading at the docks or, or whatever. I mean, there's, and so with them going to work so early, I find that as adults, they still really thrust themselves into working a lot in their marriages they're always keeping busy. They have a hard time just kind of relaxing. And they are they don't describe having very many needs for closeness. And they right. tend to right. understand why their partners get so emotional. What's the big deal? You know, if, if you just give me sex every now and then, I'm fine. You know, they say that they don't have many needs. And sometimes they'll even say they don't have any needs. Mm. And so that feels like a curveball. If you're saying you don't have any needs which I know isn't true, but how yeah. can we, you know, talk about this in a language that's going to help that client understand? Yeah, I mean, I, I can relate to that. I think we all can to work with clients. I mean, I've, I've heard it. It can be so simple as where do you want to eat, you know, where do you want to eat out, you know? Yeah. I don't care where do you want to eat out. Well, no, where do you want to eat out? Well, I don't matter. Just tell me where you want to eat out. Uh, to me... Of course, we can all get in that one, okay? But but for a withdrawer, they really, really, really are more aware of, uh, well, they're not aware of their needs. Well, for the first thing, we don't know what we feel. We really don't know what, what we need. So it really starts there. Sure. So if I grew up in a household uh, or a situation where if I hurt, you know, emotionally, physically, experience pain or whatever, and I don't, no one really responds to that, to my call for help. Uh, I learned very, and might, maybe even might be dangerous for me too in some settings to be vulnerable and to let somebody in on the fact that I'm hurt. Uh, whether, and especially in emotional pain, I mean, coming from I'm having a bad day at school, you know, you just kind of go to your room and, instead of going and turning to somebody. So, I mean, so you, I think the activity, and we look at, uh, the strain situation, the more avoidant children, they turn to activities, they turn to play. Uh, it's a way of uh, self-regulating, really, or just a distraction of, of, to me, a distraction of what we really need at the core foundation of who we are. Um, and, you know, it, it's like, why go to the well to get water if the well, if the, wa- if the well's dry? So if I have these emotions that come up, as a young person in a big person's world and the people around me don't really respond to me in any way or might even chastise me, dismiss it, or it may hurt worse that it sort of drops flat and no one responds to me than it is to hurt. It's just, it's easier to have, and it makes sense really that you would, uh, for, I guess, your emotional survival, you'd have to come up with coping strategies to deal with. You just suck it up and deal with it on your own, tough it Um, out. Yeah, very much so. So how do you begin to even have that conversation with somebody who's built these strategies as to why this is important or, or necessary in their relationship? Well, I mean, it depends on the person, obviously. I can think of a client I just had in an intensive here just day before yesterday um, who very, very successful incredibly successful in all areas of their life, but um, in his wife's eyes, he's 
you know, really has failed them, failed her and the kids in so many ways. Um, and he would, he would say that he didn't, you know, know what that he was, it wasn't he couldn't feel, but he, it was just such an uncomfortable thing. And he'd always thought his way out of feeling and which made him very successful, I'm sure. Uh, but the problem is, of course, he couldn't connect with his wife around that. Um, so to me, the beautiful thing about working with couples is that uh, her pain, as she communicated her pain of not feeling heard at times, or the big thing was not feeling cherished for her or him even being curious about her. She, he, she had difficulty understanding why he wasn't curious about her like she is about him. Like, how was your day and what was things going? How did your meeting go? She said, I'm very involved in him. But there was no, she, he never really kind of turned to her and it's with any kind of curiosity. Yeah. Uh, that was a real painful thing for her, you know. Yeah, I see this come up a lot. Like clients, again, who, you know, they they describe themselves as very simple and their needs and their emotions and they come home from a long day at the office and they just want to turn on the football game and unwind. They don't want to talk to anybody. They don't want mm -hmm. to talk to their wives or their kids. They just, you know, everybody leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and some of that, I think there's some culture too, you know, that supports that, you know, um, in a big way. And um, I grew up in very, you know, in rural Texas and uh, grew up around agriculture, or that was a, a, a real interest of mine anyway from very early on. And I mean, you know, it's a hard life. People who work out um, have to work off, you know, depend on the land to make their living where they, wherever that is in the world. Mm -hmm. It's a hard life. There's a lot of variables involved. Um, and there's a lot on the line. Um, I spent six and a half years in West Africa. If they didn't get rain, didn't make a crop, you know. I mean, their lives and the, li you know, the, the lives of their children depended on that. So uh, there's a lot of stress around that. So there was a, a real, um, I mean, you had to be on your game. And yeah. you had to be intentional. And uh, it's hot. And it's painful, uh, but you have to be able to cut that off and do what you have to do, you know, work long days or whatever, because your life depends on it. And mm -hmm. I know that's changed some in our cultures, this mechanization, but I think, I think that the, the culture, there's still culture that's still there. Uh, Very much so. And I love how you talk about that survival, living off the land. It's like they're working so hard. They don't have a lot of bandwidth to think about anything else. <laughs> well, not a lot of interaction other than, you know, just what they have at home. And there are a lot of times in my world is that we're out doing ind independently doing chores and accomplishing things. Uh, and that was really, you know, that was really looked up to. Um, so, yeah, that's a part of it. And um, then we, you know, you can move into like, uh, I would do a lot of work with the military. George and I work a lot with, those guys and um, I mean they're they're not only avoidant but they're trained to be avoidant yeah. um, it's not a natural thing to run into gunfire that's right and, um, so you know that's you so I guess you're asking your question how do you work with those those kind of people I'd say the first thing is even with the the military guys is allow the wife or their spouse, partner, whatever, to be the, the evocative stimuli um, so that they will really be moved at these, at these foundational levels and these core attachment longings and needs, right, come online um, because they're, the one they love can move them in ways that we could never move them. So mm -hmm. I think that's the first thing I try to do is to try to really um, and sometimes we want to sort of you know like whoa we don't want to do that and you know turn this loose and she may get you know she or he or whatever the more the pursuer the one who's really more the blaming criticizing one don't want to really open that up but it's in those key movements that they're they cannot not feel really yeah may not be able to be 
uh, access it for any length of time. They may not be able to name it because no one helped them find language for it when they were little. Yeah. Uh, and small, but um, that's the that's what that's the advantage of uh, working in a, in a couple relationship. Yeah. So I love how you said, basically, you use the partner as the stimuli, which is so. Right helpful it's like you work with them by working with their partner and i love how you said there's no way that they can't not feel in that i mean they're they're going to probably try they're going to work really hard but the more that yeah. you can access them through their spouse and help them find language because again perhaps nobody ever taught them the words or how to put words to it you know that's going to be a process that you know you go through then what about when you talk about getting into stage two and you're trying to help them bond mm -hmm. and again, you run up against those, you know, maybe they are, they're able to tolerate their partner's emotions a little bit more and have a little bit more understanding and maybe they're willing to show up for their partner's needs. But again, in terms of their own, they're not really turned tuned into their appetite or craving for attachment. Right. Yeah, that's the re-engaging, withdrawal re-engagement is re-engaging with self. Uh, sometimes we get that confused. I mean, it translates into re-engaging with other, but that's mm -hmm. it. To me, um, to me, that's the important part. That's, I mean, we're already, it's almost like, a, uh, like we, we're very familiar with the physical muscle groups that we go and exercise and work. There's emotional muscle groups. And stage one is a real you know, it's, it's an opportunity for us to really help them begin to exercise those emotions. We, I don't, and I don't, I don't think it, we, we have to help them find language for it, words for it too. A lot of people have problems with that, but if we don't, they won't have it. And we do it in a, in a tentative way. And we, you know, we offer it up. And uh, I did that uh, this last week again with one of my clients and they were real quick to, and I really appreciate that too. The, about them they would really 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 quick to correct me no it's not that but it's this right and so then 10 minutes later you know i think i i think i uh, i suggested it was sad you know and uh anyway about they said no it wasn't that and then about five minutes later then they said it's sad and i'm thinking well I mean, I just, we just talked about this five minutes ago. <laughs> what, what's with the lag time here? But they weren't there yet. So that's a really good thing, right? That they say, no, it's not that, it's this. And then they work through it. And then they find it their self. They find that, that word. So, um, you so I think that's an important part, the evocative stimuli and, the, and, and giving ourselves permission to be, sit with them, walk around their experience and help them find that language and, I think the big thing with my military guys uh, I focus on is uh, that emotion is a process uh, that takes the heat off a little bit. Uh, if, if we're, if it's, we're just sitting there trying to find a, a word, a feeling word. Um, I personally don't think there's a whole lot of value in just finding that word. It's the process of emotion. It's the cue. It's the first appraisal physical arousal, the second appraisal, and action tendency. We help them connect all that, and they can find that. Uh, I, I, my experience has been that there will be an emotion that will unfold for them, that will come up to describe that emotional state. And if it doesn't, it'll permeate the room, and I can use myself to um, suggest maybe or offer that emotion up. And it's typically they can find it that way. Um, yeah, you'll you'll be working with the emotion that comes alive in the room and just sort of conjecture around with yeah. them. Yeah. And I think you said something really important about withdrawal re-engagement, how it can really be re-engagement with the self, which results in re-engagement with their partner as well. And can you maybe give some strategies or ideas of language that you might use when you are leading off the process of withdrawal re-engagement to your withdrawers again the ones that say like i'm good on my needs as long as my wife is fine yeah. and everybody's happy again i'm fine there 
you know, and you ask them to go inside and they're like, there's just not much happening. Like I, yeah. I'm seriously just fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, by the time they get to stage two, they've had some extra, they've had some practice there. But, um, again, um, well, another big piece I get is, I don't know. I, I train horses. I mean, for fun, I'm not a professional trainer, but we have a saying, you know, you set the horse up for success and you reward the slightest try. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so true working with withdrawers. We set them up for success. We don't ask them to go to the deepest, darkest place right away. We, we just meet them where they're at mm -hmm. and we reflect and help them expand that. And then, that, then, and then typically something else perhaps will, will kind of come out of that. Um, but we validate, validate, validate. Any, any attempt they make, anything that they offer us. And it needs to be authentic. I mean, it needs to be real. But the more I work with withdrawers, and by the way, I'm, I'm a withdrawer in recovery. So <laughs> I can, I can, uh, I can relate to that, all this, this conversation pretty well. Yeah, I mean, it, it just, um, the more I work with withdrawers and the more I see that they really, I mean, it's, it's there. We have to believe it's there, and we have to also believe uh, and be convinced and really buy into the idea that they had no other op op options, that mm -hmm. this is by, that by default, we all do something, and this is what they do. And I think when we're working with them, the challenges here is, is that we can get frustrated, right, and think they're being difficult or, you know, not compliant. And then also, if you have a, the more pursuing partner who's using all the language and the emotional words that we're, we want to grab onto, because after all, that's what we're looking for. I mean, it's easier to, you know, I think maybe lose our alliance and uh, with our, with the which are or, or lose our ability to have, find empathy and connect with them, um, but I think I think validation is really really huge, um, mm. the biggest thing in, yeah. in working. Of course, you don't know. Of course, that would be hard for you. No one really helped you find words for that, you know, in the past. Or. And I, what kind of comes to mind is in this place is we're asking them to make a shift from individual coping to relational coping. Oh, and so yeah. Even though they may be fine doing it on their own, the idea is to build more connection with their partner. And if they can involve the partner in their soothing and get it together, then that's going to help strengthen the relationship. So, you know, in some ways we're going to talk to them about how this will you know, on behalf of their marriage, will they allow themselves to, to bring this part of themselves in contact with their partner? Yeah, right. I mean, there's a fear of accessing, right, for some of us, and, and particularly with withdrawers, a fear of accessing emotion. Mm -hmm. That's a difficult process, knowing, kind of take the elevator down, knowing, connecting the dots, what do I tell myself, what am I feeling? How do I find a word that describes it or give an image or whatever that looks like? Then it's a whole nother thing to then ask you to share that, right? Express it. So accessing it and then expressing it. Um, and sometimes that when you one thing, if you, if you can't access it very easy, it's probably because you, no one's really been accessible to you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then we're asking them to express it to other. And so what is the expectation? Well, history say no one's going to be there for me when it happens. So and at various levels, but I always kind of think about that when I work with my client, like, okay, with the real withdrawal, someone is really, really withdrawn uh, and has an avoidance strategy. Like, you know, what, I mean, what, what do they, uh, is it more difficult and challenging for them to access and find language for what they're doing? Or is it, is, is it around the vulnerability of expressing it in this setting or is it expressing to other? Uh, maybe kind of slicing that a little thinner. And my little light goes on when you're saying that. And Kenny, tell me what you would say to this when a client says, I just, there's just not anything going on there. I'm mm -hmm. seriously just fine and happy. And it's like you're wanting me to access something that's not there. Mm hmm. And I would say, um, I hear you. 
I hear you, but you fell in love with her, right? You fell in love with her. You felt that. And you're here because you're wanting to feel that again. And yes, it's hard to find language for it. But, you know, it's very important for you to find language for what, what's going on with you. Sort of operating with half, half the information you need to get around in life, you know. And this is really what she's longing for here, by the way, as well, right? So that's what we're going to work on, okay? So what's it like right now as I talk to you about this? So what, what happens sometimes if we get, if we ask the same question too many times or come at it from, we just assume the role of the pursuer. Mm -hmm. Now we're nagging, we're poking, we're prying. And I've been caught, caught at this before. <laughs> I, I had a client one time say, Kenny, I think you're fishing for something and I'm not sure I know what it is, right? Yeah. So I was on, in his mind, I was on the fishing, fishing expedition. I was trying to find, and what is he as, as a withdrawer, what is he telling me? I'll placate, tell me, give me multiple choice. I'll pick something, okay? Anything, but get, get away, get, this, get me out from under this uncomfortable <laughs> place of not knowing. So where and, did you go from there? Huh? Where did you go from there with him? I, I said, um, I said, I hear you. I said, you know what? I said, I, I, um, I said, I have, I forget what exactly what I said, but probably something to affect. Uh, yeah, I'm moving way too fast. I'm moving way too fast. And, um, you know, this isn't about me trying to poke and pry, by the way. And that's not what, that isn't going to help you. That's not why we're here. My goal is, is just to kind of walk around with you in this and help, help you find language for it. And that's what I'm trying to do. But if I ever, and thanks for telling me that, because I never want you to feel like I'm trying to fish for something or trying to, you know, coach you into coming up with some word to describe what you're, go what you're going with. And then I turned to probably, if I, I don't know what I did exactly, I don't remember, but I probably would turn the conversation back to her and then ask her what was it like for her right now in this right now what's happening for her and to kind of sit with that and maybe give him a rest or maybe she would have a, some comment on on what just happened and maybe that would awaken something in him but you know i mean he's just saying i need i, I i'm drowning here you're holding my head underwater i don't know when i'm coming up for breath i only get when i'll catch my next breath so we just let him up you know and mm -hmm. and I, I did move too fast obviously i was lost my attunement with him i was I had crossed over into mm -hmm. pushing. And uh, so, I, again, I think creating safety is huge. We have to feel safe enough to feel. I think that happens validation, normalizing, not pathologizing. They already feel like, most withdrawers feel like, um, you know, there's something wrong with them anyway at some yeah. level. And yeah. uh, that fears, That's something we want to reinforce. Yeah, right. Yeah, so what you're saying, Kenny, is that, you know, when they start to give that, I love how you said, you know, the withdrawer position might be if, if we start to poke or join the side of the pursuer and we're after something, we're trying to get more. And, you know, the client is saying, you know, I feel like you're trying to get something from me that's not there, which I have heard from yeah. the client, you know, just to be able to back up and, and maybe, um, you know, validate what, what's happening and maybe be a little more clear about what our focus is. I love how you mm -hmm. said, my goal is not to, you know, try to poke you and, and thank you for telling me, you know, I'm really just trying to walk around with you in this, mm -hmm. you know, just making that process really explicit. And then you said you might, you know, again, go back to their partner and kind of use them as the stimulus again, I'm guessing. Yeah, might do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, I mean, or, yeah, or, yeah, that may, that may naturally evolve. If it doesn't, then, um, you know, just sort of give the, the other person a break, get some breathing room. But I think the hard thing about withdrawers and avoiders is that, we see them as maybe being avoidant of attachment. And I know that's not true. I mean, obviously they got married for a reason, you know, sure. instead of staying alone when they could have, if that was obviously such a better, more ideal choice. So helping them tap into the reasons why they got 
married, why they got together, why they wanted connection. That avoidance isn't an avoidance of attachment. It's avoidance of pain. It's avoidance of emotion. It's a coping strategy. Am I getting that? Yeah, absolutely. And in their world, when they feel stress, they, again, they come from that individual coping model where they've never learned to, to self soothe with other people. Maybe not necessarily, they weren't, a lot of them weren't necessarily given negative signs around it. It's just, they grew up, like you said, in a culture. And I find this a lot in the, in the rural farm communities is that, you know, everybody's just busy on the farm. You know, nobody's got time for extra social connection during the day. It's just get the business done, you know, and they go out to play and, you know, with the neighbor kids, no one's really getting around talking about emotions. So it's not that they haven't gotten bad messages. They just maybe got no messages about Mm -hmm. let's get together and talk about it. It's more, we got to keep going. We got to keep surviving. So just find a way to to power through and deal with it. So they were just kind of taught a a self-regulating strategy. And even the science is clear. If we can co-regulate, it's going to lighten the load. And I think a lot of people have this belief that that co-regulation somehow means like codependency, which is not a form of secure attachment, by the way. (laughs) And, you know, they're thinking, oh, somehow this means I – like it's a threat to my independence and healthy connection should not be a threat to your independence. They they should theoretically go hand in hand, the two sides of the same attachment coin, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's where it throws uh, our culture on its ear in America, North America, right. And is that, you know, we're all about autonomy and independence. And I think the message out there is very strong that, you know, but that's something we sh- we have to do by ourselves. But uh, and then you try to tell somebody that you know it's actually on the backside of safe connection, and that that can that trips a lot of a lot of folks up because. But it is. I mean, I got, I got. Uh, you know, we've all been around children, had children, grandkids, or whatever, and you know they'll they'll hang on your pants leg and they'll run off. You know. And maybe in the store or something, and they don't get very far, and they realize how far they've got away, and they'll turn around and run back, right? So there's that safe base. But we don't ever outgrow that. We need to know we have a safe base. Now, they need to physically come back, but we can do that in our heads and our hearts and be all the way across the world from someone. But we know we have that safe base, and we know we can reach them. And and so, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a hard sell. Um, mm-hmm. I think more in America now than ever um, that we actually, you know, to be in connection. So, yeah, I think you're right. The North American culture is very much do it on your own. You know, needing is bad. Being dependent on others is bad, but really our species would not survive if we couldn't depend on each other. You know, we need that cooperation among each other to be able to survive. Yeah, I can, I can give you an example in my own life and I had love, very loving parents, but it was, it was very much the culture of the time. And I think some of the community I grew up in, like when I was old enough to like walk to the front door of the doctor's office with my, my sister who was two years younger than me. I mean, we go in and we get our shots. We'd come out, sit on the curb, wait for someone to pick us up. You know, we had to get our shots for, for school. That feels like, that sounds like the most horrible thing you could ever do. <laughs> Maybe that's why I messed up. But it sounds like the most horrible thing you could do to a child. But, but back then, in that, in, that, in that culture where I grew up, it was like, you've got to, you've got to be tough. You've got to be independent and, you know, no, no time for tears. And, um, you know, and, it, and things have shifted and changed. Culture is always changing. Um, there, there wasn't anything deviant behind it. That was just that was just the thought of the time. I mean, same thing with, you know, if the baby cries, let them cry. Uh, you know, they, you know, it's all about independence. And so, I think a lot of it is, you know, it's steeped in culture and what's valued. And 
but I think uh, there's some, a lot of positive things. Uh, there's a really good example of that in, in a movie. I don't know if you guys have seen Meet the Parents, but they did a um, sequel to that, Meet the Fockers. And, um, you know, flash over parenting over the grandbaby. And, you know, I, it was uh, Robert De Niro, you know, is that like ex-CIA, very like, we use the Ferber method. We let him cry it out. Yeah. <laughs> and then... You know, you have, oh, what's the actor's name? Dustin Hoffman. And he's like, we use the Fokker method. That's their last yeah. name. I'm not swearing. Yeah. <laughs> the Fokker method. We hug and kiss that little prince, <laughs> you know. So it was just two very different parenting strategies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And with, so, I mean, we can see we're avoidant attachment. And by the way, there's, um, you know, George talks about this a lot, too, of the trained uh, shared trainings with him but he talks about it a lot too about you know having appreciation for what they bring into uh, the world as well avoidance so if if i'm flying i hope i would prefer my pilot be on the avoidance side of things and can com or at least get good at compartmentalizing because right. I, I wouldn't feel very much comfort if he said you know i've had a real rough night last night i didn't sleep me and the wife got you know, got in a fight and, and the baby's got colic, but you know, Hey, I'm doing the best I can to stay awake here. And I hope to get you out of the other side. I don't want to know that. <laughs> in that setting, I just want to know you do, can do your job, you know, and just say, tell me what you know to do. So I mean, yeah. compartmentalization, it, it serves a big purpose. It, it, it's problematic when we cannot cut it. You know, we, we, sort of cut our emotions off but when we can't cut them back on that's that's With the problem flexibility and and i know you know with the military population too they also talk about i know the joke was the military doesn't issue emotions and i know that if you had to have an emotion pick anger and particularly in war or battle situations you know always pick anger over fear because fear will shut you down and can paralyze you and that's not safe for war situations but right. you know flood your body with certain chemicals adrenaline to help mobilize you to fight so it keeps you safe and then you know with a lot of soldiers a lot of one of the only emotions they can identify with is a lot of anger sure you know? yeah so helping that yeah. flexibility so so is there any, do you have any suggestions of language or maybe metaphors, words that we can use that can help? Because obviously, you know, with the rural community, and, and I think a lot of us have these guys. I mean, I, though I have clients that moved to Las Vegas, a lot of them grew up on farms in Indiana or, you know, just various parts of the U.S., I know we have a lot of um, EFTers in Canada and there's still a lot of rural farming communities up there and they don't really identify with the warm fuzzy language, you know, which some EFT trainers are beautiful at, but what kind of language could we use that might more appropriately or better relate to clients in this? Well, i, I tell you one I give and I can give this in my trainings. I mean, I, I have an old, I had an old farm truck. I just, I sold it a year or so ago, but I'd had it for, Oh my gosh, 28 years, I think. It was old. And I, I could go at night and turn the key on, and every check engine light was on. You could like read a book. It was such a mess. Uh, but that check engine light, what does it tell us? It tells us to something's right, not right under the hood. So we can drive, keep driving it. And if it starts making noise, we can turn the radio up louder. If it starts, uh, you know, uh, the, if the lights, check engine lights bother us, we could put a piece of tape over it. And then, I mean, if we start, all starts burning or whatever, we can roll the window down. But eventually, I mean, it's telling us something. It's important information. Look under the hood. Mm -hmm. and, and so something's going to go bad if we don't do it. So that's, that. that's the kind of, maybe the kind of um, image I would give maybe that would be helpful or I have found that helpful. I think with, uh, yeah. some I think that's great. So using that, so. tech engine light and how. Yeah. Tech and engine. Then, yeah. And then the other piece is, you know, no one ever held the hood up for you. Yeah. To look inside to see what was going on. And yeah. that's why we're here, you know, yep. and that's, 
That's You're what you want well, to do. Well, yeah. you check that. that yeah. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't a job we could do by ourselves. And that's yeah. why we're here. And that's why you guys are working on this. Okay. And then we just kind of roll back in. So. Yeah. And it's not that you can't do it alone, but it's a lot easier, you know, when you have an extra set of hands. Right. Right. And we know it's so much less stressful and, and takes 80% less energy or something to have someone co-regulate you than just to try to solve it on your own. Yeah. Um, I often use that, you know, because, you know, when your body douses you with all those stress hormones, it's hard on your heart. It's hard on, you know, different organs within your body. And so when you can co-regulate, it lightens that load and it just, it's good for your body. <laughs> you know, it's good for yeah. your heart metaphorically and physically. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Oh, that's a great idea of language. Thank you so much. You know, I think it's good to have different metaphors that we can adapt for different clients. And I definitely think that's a really good metaphor that's useful. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of summarize, you know, I, we talked about how, you know, there are withdrawers or avoidance that get these, you know, patterns from childhood where they're taught, self-regulation, tough it out, you know, just get through. Um, maybe they've had some trauma that's been negative experiences or they've just had no experiences that have said, you know, work it out with someone else. But their avoidance isn't of, of, pain, isn't of attachment, it's of pain, it's of emotions. And, you know, a lot of folks have grown up in cultures or environments that have nurtured that, reinforced it, like military or, again, you know, certain types of um, American living or, or world living on rural agricultural places. But I love how you said, you know, work with the partner as an emotional stimuli. Always in the EFT model, work with what comes alive in the room. Help them if they struggle with the language, don't pathologize, you know, just be with them, make the process really clear and, and validate. You said really heavy on validation for, yeah, nobody's ever helped you with this. Nobody's ever given you a language and that makes sense, right? And when we get to bonding in stage two, sort of the same thing is, you know, using their partner as a stimuli, but also helping them to re-engage with themselves, which helps them re-engage with their partner and right. helping them tune into their appetite for connection, which has probably never really been on the menu before, you know, oh. so letting them know, Hey, this is a new menu item. And in fact, your marriage can benefit greatly by doing this, so we're helping them shift from self-regulation to, mm -hmm. to co-regulation or relational soothing. Mm -hmm. And you had a lovely metaphor about the check engine light, you know, mm -hmm. using, you know, if you've got car mechanics, you've got, mm -hmm. you know, your, your farm guys, you know, using that, you've got a tractor, you've got a truck, whatever, you've got that check engine light that comes on, mm -hmm. you know, if you keep riding, and I know my dad, was a mechanic and he actually taught me that do not ride in your car with that check engine light <laughs> something could cause way more damage so you need to get that checked out so yeah help tune into that and be aware of that yeah that's Very beautiful so. well, thank you so much kenny for being with us now you're in tennessee do you have a website do you have trainings have you published anything uh yes we have uh eft uh tennessee you can go to eft tennessee.com dot org whatever get us that way uh mfi marriage family institute uh you can get it the same way um and uh i uh yeah of course i i uh, co-authored the book Cred for connection with sue so we have that and that uh, again has really linked us in with the military they've kind of made that their book, at least on the chaplain side. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've been doing a lot of work around it, and we have uh, videotapes and training manuals and everything else that goes, goes with that. I am in the middle of writing a book, finishing a book, and I've been uh, trying to finish it for over a year. <laughs> yeah. What so is your book? Should, 
it's it is going to be a uh, like a 40 day follow up from a homey tight or a create for connection so that when a couple leaves that experience they'll have uh, something to s sort of uh, attachment ritual to sit in with and carry on uh, you know be able to maintain some momentum there so mm -hmm. so that's that's uh, coming on and I, I mean we have all my trainings are on my website and um, uh, and also on the ICF website. So, perfect. And I will put a link to your guys's websites, um, both the MFI and the Tennessee EFT, on the description for this video in on YouTube. And also a link to Creative for Connection. Is that available for purchase on Amazon? Uh, it is, but I also sell them. Uh, I sell all the I sell the homey tight uh, trainers manuals. Um, I mean, facilitator guide in the videos that. So I'm sort of the North American distributor of those products. The book itself is on Amazon, um, and it's might, probably might be even easier to get that. But if this the facilitator guides for the others and the videotapes that go with it, it's it's all on my website as well. So. Perfect. Perfect. So we'll make sure that we put that up that you guys can find it. And can people email you through your website? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Perfect. So if you guys are curious and you want to attend a training that Kenny offers, you know, he's on the East coast. And if you like to invite him to do a training in your area, just go ahead and send him an email and I'm sure he'd be more than willing to work out a schedule and, and a plan. And you know, especially, just think, especially if it's good fishing, where there's good fishing. <laughs> good fishing. All right, we'll keep that in mind. <laughs> That's my priorities in this season in my life. <laughs> Maybe we should get an EFT training going in Alaska then. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Well, thank you again so much, Kenny, for being on our episode today. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Oh, thank you. It's my honor. Thank you. And thank you so much to our visitors. Make sure that you hit subscribe because more episodes are on the way. Mm -hmm.